today I'm talking about building machine learning tools with scalding with particular emphasis on what I learned about what I think we can do to increase ease of use and encourage widespread adoption. So who am I? Why am I here talking to you now about this? Uh, I'm a data scientist at DeepSignal. We make software to help predict needed maintenance in oil and gas pipelines and try and prevent failures. So I was previously a member of technical staff at Weeby Data, where I worked on the Kiji project, which is how I got introduced to Scalding. So I'm also someone that's contributed to Scalding. I think it's a really great uh, software library to use, and so I really want to see people use it. So the Kiji project is an open source project meant to support building real-time big data applications. So that's a buzzword packed phrase that I'm going to try and unpack for you and sort of explain that this now actually means something <laughs> that's probably important to everyone in this room. So big data applications are things like Twitter, where you would follow someone and Twitter will suggest people for you to follow. Netflix, where based on your browsing and viewing history, you'll get recommended movies you might want to watch. Amazon, where products that you've bought before or looked at will get recommended to you as you're browsing. Or Google, where you know, they used to personalize your reader. Oh, low blow. <laughs> so the technology that supports big data applications is maturing quite a lot. Most of those companies I had mentioned used some, some part of the Hadoop infrastructure or were their originators of the sort of version that Hadoop is imitating. Um, most of these applications will have some sort of distributed key value store right in the center, either HBase or Cassandra. In Kiji, we sort of uh, initially assumed HBase, but now also support Cassandra. And so these were all, you know, those companies are all sort of pioneers in using and building this sort of open source stack that's available. And so with this sort of support from lots of companies, you know, especially companies uh, like Cloudera, we also have seen a ton of different open source projects that are available to support building these big data applications, along with really creepy logos. I'm looking at you, pig. <laughs> um, so this technology is, you know, it's maturing, it's becoming more stable. There's lots of different options for types of things that you could use. And companies that are not necessarily explicitly technologically focused are able to use uh, this, this sort of fantastic open source stack. So if we look at a particular industry, we can see that you know, now in retail, companies that are sort of brick and mortar stores that you would see in malls and feel familiar there, uh, feel familiar seeing there, they have these online presences, but they want them to be more like Amazon's. And so this open source stack that we've all been building, its maturity is allowing it to get much more widespread. And I think that's something that uh, you know, projects need to begin to adopt and sort of move towards. So, you know, these retail companies, they want to be more like that personalized Amazon experience. So when I go and look at my favorite joke book on Amazon, which is a million random digits and a hundred thousand normal deviates, which is literally a big book of random numbers, it has excellent reviews, about 550 of them, mostly about the plot line. But, you know, don't let it give away any spoilers. Um, Amazon recognizes that you maybe came to just view this. <laughs> and so they'll tell you that you know, customers who viewed this item have also viewed a funny math mug and the 2009 to 2014 world report on wooden toilet seats and looking for best of David Hasselhoff, which appears to be an audio CD. So you know, companies want to provide this sort of personalized experience. The way that we try to provide this personalized experience that applies quickly in real time is by splitting apart the model building from the model application. So as long as model application happens very quickly, which is the whole point of the Kiji project, we can do whatever we need in the model building phase as slowly as we need, meaning we can use something like MapReduce. But notice I said something like MapReduce. We wouldn't use Java MapReduce because I think people have gone to great lengths to avoid using that. Uh, particularly, <laughs> there's a number of projects to choose from when you're trying to avoid using plain Java vanilla or MapReduce. Uh, it's kind of like being a kid in a candy store. There's a ton of very good projects. In the Kiji project, we of course chose Scalding, but we could have chosen Cascading, Crunch, Scrunch, Scooby, Pig. <laughs> I know all the names really get me too. <laughs> um, so. 
how do we choose between these? I think we had some relatively easy, relatable criteria that anyone in this audience would have also had. You know, is it easy for our users to use? Well, yes, we chose it. Um, we do believe that this is, that scalding is easy for users to use. It's at a level of abstraction that people want to work with when thinking about manipulations of their data. But I want to say this with an asterisk, because when you look at the users that we started bringing this to in the Kiji project, they're not necessarily, say, software engineers that specialize in Scala. Often, they had backgrounds that were more like Java uh, sort of enterprise engineers or people that were more used to R or Python for coding and doing their model building. So people with sort of data science backgrounds. And so getting introduced to Scalding also necessarily meant getting introduced to Scala. Uh, and this can be a large leap for people and a lot to learn all at once. <laughs> so yes, asterisk. I think it was mostly easy for people, but there's some initial startup costs that can be difficult. Was it easy for us to develop with? I think absolutely. Uh, we had prototyped our system on another library previously, and we had found that the way that that library was written, at its core, there were a bunch of nested implicit conversions that made it very difficult to debug when we had problems. And so our scalding prototype, it was really clear what we needed to do in order to use scalding. You know, we needed to provide the right sources. Uh, and we found it very easy to debug and sort of interact with. So, you know, thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, and does it have a collaborative community? I think absolutely yes. You know, we really wanted to make sure that when we engage with a software project that it's an active development, which obviously it is, yay, point nine, uh, that it has a lot of collaborators and there, that it accepts contributions from outside sources. And I think all of these things are true about working with Scalding. So, you know, we've decided that Scalding fits our criteria. Uh, we decide to build our model building sort of facilities using it. And then we need to go out, we had to go out to users and convince them that Scalding is, is absolutely the right choice and this is going to make their lives easier. And so at this point in the talk, I could talk about, you know, the intricacies of mapping the H-based data model into a tuple in Scalding. But I think what would be more, well, I thought what would be more useful and interesting for me to, to discuss right now is what it was like to introduce people to Scalding and what I think we could be doing better to get them onto that, like through that onboarding process and more excited and engaged with the community quickly. So let's talk about adopting Scalding, Scalding and by proxy Scala. A few weeks ago, uh, the creator of the Jenkins project, Kosuki Kawaguchi, put great slides on the internet where he compares building a developer community in Jenkins to a customer conversion funnel, where you have people that are visitors or sort of casually interested in using a project, and you turn them into users, and people that are users into developers. And so a, a main point of his argument that he makes is that small irritations and inconveniences add up really quickly, especially in the early stages, and sort of turn people away from wanting to, to use a project. And so the more that you can do to sort of smooth over rough spots or any sort of like introductory, introductory uh, difficulty, the larger user base you'll have and eventually the larger developer base you have. So first let's talk about what we could do in order to sort of increase people going from being casually interested in Scalding to being uh, like fully using the software and recognizing that it's useful for them. So, I think there's a lot of things that Scalding does really well uh, with respect to this. So the runnable tutorials are by far my favorite introductory feature. I think every project should have working code examples that are the int introduction that you know are constantly being tested. Um, Scalding has a ton of runnable tutorials. They have them for the Matrix API just all over. It's fantastic and people use them a lot. The existence of a REPL I think lets it makes it easier for people to interact with Scalding and sort of quickly get up and running using it. And again, many, many good code examples. So I have a sidebar here that's sort of a, a section from the index on the wiki. I think Scalding has an incredible amount of documentation and it makes people significantly more comfortable, especially when they're coming over from a background that doesn't include Scala. So 
the things that work less well, or I think could be improved, are Scaladocs. And this is actually not something that's necessarily even specific to scalding. So I would go and introduce people to scalding, and they would, they would get excited to start working on it. They then have a problem, and they look at Scaladocs, and suddenly I just hear yelling. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> and I think often Scaladocs are very overwhelming with information for people, and people, especially from a Java background, have the most like unholy resistance to the idea of Scaladocs. And so I think the best thing that we can do is to sort of understand that people that are new to a project, new to a Scala-based project, are not going to be happy with Scaladocs, and they want as many examples as possible. And so putting uh, example code in the main body of Scaladocs, particularly for classes that they're likely to interact with, I think d does a huge, helps quite a lot. I think having a landing page for Scalding would be nice. This is simple. It's kind of like flashy. <laughs> uh, but you know, right now, if you go to the Scalding homepage, you go to the GitHub repo, and your first screen full is an overview of the directory structure which is useful for some people, but not necessarily for all. And I think having a sort of you know, simple page that points people to where they want to go, particularly if they're sort of initially in interested in just trying out scalding and aren't quite at the level where they are really excited to see the directory structure, would be really useful. <laughs> um, another thing that I think could be improved is that we could document common patterns more. And this is something that I actually saw Oscar mention on the developers list a few weeks ago, where, you know, it's not uncommon for someone to have a question about how to do X type of thing. And eventually they'll find an old thread that's, that explains how to do you know, X thing. Uh, having a runnable repo of these sort of examples would be a really great resource for two reasons. I mean, first, as I've sort of been harping on here, people don't like Scaladocs, but they love examples. But also, having a, having a place to look at how the API that we're providing is being used, I think will allow us to see not only allow us to see not only what it works really well and what is easy, but also the rough spots and what could be used better or sort of formed better for easy use. And the lunch break test. So the lunch break test, I think, is is a passing the lunch break test is a place that I would be happy to to be at and help contribute to in the Scalding project. So in my mind, the lunch break test is there's a developer, there's a data scientist, they heard about this awesome new project called Scalding. And they want to go try it out. And so they're going to download something, and they're going to try it on their lunch break and decide if this is like the project for them. So do we pass the lunch break test right now? Is it easy to, to quickly know if you really want to use Scalding for what you intend to use it for? So, at Weeby Data, we noticed that MongoDB absolutely passes the lunch break test. They make it very easy to get started using their software and putting data into, into MongoDB and, and manipulating it. They have like a little REPL like, uh, in a page. It's, it's cute and it's flashy and it works fast and it's easy. So we were a little bit jealous of this, especially working in the Hadoop ecosystem where if you want a running installation of Hadoop, you could spend a day installing it on your computer, or you can have a virtual machine. Uh, so what we ended up doing was building this project called the Bento Box. The Bento Box, I, I think, is probably one of my favorite pieces of software that we got out in the Kiji project. It is a tiny cluster. So you download it, you install it, you type bento start, and suddenly all of the Hadoop services that you expect to be running, like Zookeeper, name node, job tracker, everything, uh, is suddenly up and running and it lives in a single process in your machine, and you can just stop it by typing bento stop. So having this sort of environment that quick, quickly let users get up and running in the Kiji project and writing a, a MapReduce job that runs over a Kiji table, which is really just an HBase table, we found to be very useful. And having that sort of ease of startup for people, they really responded to and got to try out the Kiji project. Uh, very easily and quickly. And so, you know, we maybe don't need to make our own tiny cluster people can install, but having something people can quickly interact with uh, and sort of get used to the feeling of using Scalding would be fantastic. Uh, and I think the REPL is actually a pretty good candidate of a nice interactive way that we can try and pass the lunch break test. So 
the next sort of conversion, I think, to talk about is how do we get users to become developers? So the good, like what's working great right now? I think there's a welcoming and supportive community. Uh, everyone that I've talked to and interacted with and worked with is awesome to work with. Um, there's clear instructions on running and testing the project. This is something that if you skip, no one is ever going to be able to help you without breaking your world. And so you might as well give them instructions on how to not break your world or at least know when they've done it. Uh, effective Scala, I call this out as a specific resource of not just learning Scala, but learning how to write maintainable code in Scala. So, you know, as a professional software engineering team that was working on the Kiji project that needed, needed to move from primarily writing in Java to primarily writing in Scala, you know, having these resources that are written by people who have a lot of experience writing Scala was very useful to find and know about. Um, things that could be improved. GitHub issue gardening. There are a ton of issues. This is not the most exciting work in the world, but being able to navigate issues, see what's still important and what, what would be useful to work on is a very obvious way to sort of allow people to figure out what they should be working on in this project. And very related to that in the sort of organizi organizing the GitHub issues is pointing out good introductory tic tickets for people to have a look at with like a newbie tag or something like that. And regular meetups, because I think people seeing, seeing people's faces is very useful. <laughs> it allows you to talk about things that are on your mind. People can share stories about what's worked well for them, what hasn't worked well, and uh, just sort of get excited and creative about things that we could be working on together. So, you know, I came here to talk about what, uh, what building machine learning tools with the Kiju project, <laughs> with Scalding in the Kiju project was like. And the point that I'm really trying to get across is that, you know, we have this, these wonderful facilities with Scalding that we had introduced to data scientists. And the problems that they had with it weren't when they actually got into using it. They mostly found that to be very easy and was, like simple to work with and maps onto what they like. But the getting started part was challenging. <laughs> and so I think investing more time as a community to think about that, about how we can make this sort of onboarding process easier would make Scalding both easier to use and more widely adopted. So the question I want to ask and just sort of like leave on people's minds is how can we make everything easier? Uh, I'm very excited about working on these things. So if you want to work on these things, you know, send me an email, tweet at me. <laughs> and thanks for listening. <laughs>